For the lesson this morning, I want you to turn to the third psalm. And I call this a morning prayer. Let's look at the psalm. There's three sections to the psalm. I want to read the psalm and then show you it doesn't start off like a, a morning prayer, but it will turn to that as we go. It says here, Psalm 3, verses 1 and 2, 3 and 4, and then 5 through 8, the three sections of this psalm. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awakened, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. The part in yellow, that's why I would call this a morning prayer, a morning psalm, a prayer, a, a prayer for the morning. I laid me down and slept, I awakened, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. So it's a prayer in the morning. Now, the, the psalm, one of the great values of the psalms is that they teach us to pray. And we call the Bible God's Word, and that's what we should call it. And every one of the Psalms then is also God's Word. But usually when we think of the Bible, we're thinking about what God has told man. It's the communication coming from God to man. Many of the Psalms are written from man to God. It's the Holy Spirit of God giving David these words, giving David these prayers, but it's a different direction, isn't it? And so the Psalms are kind of unique that way. They are prayer Psalms. And this is the first of, of many prayer Psalms. You might think that first Psalm is an instructional Psalm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor, nor standeth in the way of sinners. And it's kind of giving instruction. The second Psalm is a prophetic Psalm. And then it says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And then we look to the New Testament and saw that Psalm's quoted in the New Testament in reference to Christ, his anointed, whom he'd set upon his holy hill in Zion. But the third psalm is a prayer psalm. And by studying the psalms, we can learn better how to pray. This makes the psalms very valuable for private devotions. I've told you this many times. I want to keep telling you because I want it to, to sink in, and, and I want you to try this. When I was a young man and first left my home, my mother and father, and off to college, you know, I thought, well, I'm off on my own now. And I had a good Christian home. And I wanted to make sure that I stayed faithful to my Lord when I left home. I resolved I'd begin every morning by just opening my Bible and reading the Bible and, and having a prayer. And I begin with the book of Psalms. And so many of the Psalms are prayers. And I would read that Psalm and I'd think, you know, I can pray almost that very prayer. And I would pray a prayer kind of based on the things I'd read. Now you try that. You get up in the morning, say, I'm going to make sure I start my day hearing from God and letting God hear from me. 
And the Psalms is a good way to get into that habit, to, to read a Psalm, think about things you should pray about as you read that Psalm, then say that prayer, and then begin your day. And so the Psalms, by that, they teach us to pray. Now this Psalm is also unique, if you're looking in your Bible, it's the first Psalm with an inscription. You'll see where it says the, the chapter, at least the King James Version is laid out. It's got the chapter, or, or we call it the chapter. It says the, the third psalm, or Psalm 3. But then there, there's an inscription. And this inscription for this psalm, that is before the psalm begins, the inscription says it is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Well now, that tells us who wrote the psalm, doesn't it? It's a psalm of David. This is one of David's psalms. But then also this inscription gives us a historical background of this psalm, the occasion of this psalm. You remember the, the story of Absalom, how that uh, he raised a rebellion against his father. And when he went into Jerusalem, it tells us in Psalms chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, what? Well, but before I get to that, in Psalm 2, 10 through 12, see, David brought this on himself. David had sinned with Bathsheba. And because of that sin, he had Uriah put to death. And Nathan the prophet called his hand on that. And because of this sin... The Bible said the sword will not depart out of the house of David. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them to thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I'll do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And so we read about terrible times in the family of David. David had many wives. That was part of his problem. And he had children that would be half-brothers and sisters. Ammon, one of his sons, forced his half-sister Tamar. Tamar's brother was Absalom. Absalom put Ammon to death. David banished Absalom from Jerusalem. <coughs> Due to the influence of Joab, he allowed him to come back, but he wouldn't allow him to come into the courts where David was. Absalom was a fine-looking young man, had long, beautiful hair. And when people would come to bring their cases before David, Absalom would say, well, tell me, what, what is your problem? And, and they would tell Absalom, and Absalom would say, oh, oh, if I were the king, this is what I would do for you. Sounds like a politician, doesn't it? It says he won the hearts of Israel away from his father David. And when Absalom thought he was strong enough, he tried to take over as king. And David had to flee from Jerusalem. And it tells us that the conspiracy was strong and that daily the strength of Absalom was growing as, David was, uh, as, as Absalom was leading this rebellion. So there's the historic context of this psalm. Now the psalm has the word Selah in it. I don't know if you noticed that as we read three times, but each of the three sections ends with this word, sila. That's an old, old term. In fact, the lexographers and those that study ancient Hebrew words will tell you they're not exactly sure, can, they're not, we can't say with confidence what the word sila means. You find a word like that and you want to know what it means, sometimes you can tell something about the meaning by the way the word is used. 
The, the fact that this word is so old that its meaning is lost kind of reminds us of the antiquity of these psalms, doesn't it? But what is Silo? You find it often in the psalms. Well, here it kind of divides the, the psalm up into three sections. And the idea is thought by many that it must be some kind of a musical Notation, a musical term. If you ever look in our song book, sometimes you'll see words along with the music of the psalm that tells us something about that song and how to sing it. The, one of the lexicons says it means to lift up. And I think of a song leader. You know when a song leader's up here wanting to lead us in song, doesn't he, he lift up his hands and so sort of directs the, the singing with his hand. And while you're singing the song, well, you'll be singing, and you lift up your eyes, and, and you're looking at the song leader. And so Selah might be a reminder to the, to the chorus singing this up. Now look at the leader. Look at the leader of this psalm. Lift up and see what direction he's giving. And often the way the word Selah falls out in these psalms, it, it's like a pause in the thoughts. And, and some have suggested, okay, let's stop here. Maybe it's just stop and look at the leader. But it might be stop and think about what we've just sung and the significance of that. And here the way Selah divides the psalm into three parts, it, it maybe could be even a change in tempo. The three parts of this psalm, based on that word Selah, the first two verses is about David's trial. If you want to use the word T, think of the trial. The next two verses are about David's trust in the Lord. And then the last four verses is about his triumph over his fears. Separated out by that word Selah. Sometime in your word Selah, it almost comes across like a like a musical amen. You hear something you really like to hear and you want to say, yeah, say that. So you'll say, amen. And see, that kind of comes across that way sometimes in these psalms as well. So looking at that, let's look at the trial. Psalm 3, 1 and 2. O Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many be they which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God's Selah. Well, now that fits Absalom's conspiracy because of the way the conspiracy was growing. And many had risen against David. And there were some, probably knew some of the history here, thinking, you know, David brought this on himself. God's not going to help David now. But one of the things these psalms teach us is that even when we bring our problems on ourselves, we can still go to God in prayer. Imagine it'd be a cruel thing for David to hear people say, there's not going to be any help for him in God. That reminded me of what Jesus heard when he was on the cross and those mockers that came by and they're seeing Jesus suffering on that cross and suffering for them. And they look up and they say, he trusted God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, to think that the Father in heaven, if he'll have him, his son dying on that cross, and so David is now appealing to God for help. They're saying there's no help for David in God. But David knows better than that. And so the second part of this psalm, the trust. He says, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Now you know what you do with a shield. That's your, your protection from the, from, the, from the sword or the spear that would be coming at you. And you hold the shield up and protect well, that's what the Lord is for David. One of the commentators say that the Hebrew language would allow for this and said, thou art a shield for me. could be translated, thou art a shield about me. You see, God protects us from things that, things we don't even see. You, you remember how when the devil came to tempt Job, the God would only let the devil go so far. He protected Job 
from the devil going beyond what Job was able to bear. And we read in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make up a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Someday when we get into heaven, if we're allowed to know these things, we may be really surprised of the, the many things that God has protected us from by, by the use of the spiritual shield as we've gone through our lives. He also says, Thou art my glory. David's glory was in his God. Now, David could have gloried in his in his. Ability as a warrior. He was a good looking man. He was, he was uh, well favored. He could have gloried in his looks. He could have gloried in many things, but his glory was in his God. And here David is fleeing from his son Absalom when many casting heap and shame on him, but he knew where his glory lied, lay. And, and he says, it reminds me of 1 Peter 4, 15 through 16. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. But if any man suffers as a Christian, let him glorify God. Uh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And so David wanted to endure this trial and this suffering in such a manner that it would bring glory to God. David says the God is the lifter up of mine head. Well, you've probably done this. You've seen people do this. Just the trials of life come on them and you just hang the head down low. And, and you can just tell by the very posture someone, oh, they're, they're not feeling good. Look at how they're hanging their head low. David said, the Lord's lift up my head. Now, as I read this and knowing that David's in prayer, I think of how we often pray. We will bow and take that head and bend that head low and just think if that is expressing the, the mood and the sorrow that, that you're in and the discouragement with a head bowed low. But in that prayer, you're remembering what God has promised and his care for you and, and he will be your shield and you can glorify him in this and and by the time you ended your prayer, you've lifted your head up in praise unto God. So God is the lifter up of David's head. He says, I cried loud with my voice. Now this sounds like a private kind of prayer, but a lot of times our private prayers, we just utter them in silence, don't we? If you're ever in your closet or your way where, where people aren't going to eavesdrop and listen in on you, just say your prayer out loud to God. Go off to yourself somewhere where you can pray and use your voice in uttering your prayer before God. And he says, he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. See, David had brought the ark into Jerusalem there on that hill of Zion, the ark would rest until his son, Solomon, would build a temple for the ark. But you would think of the ark, is that, that's where God is, that's where the mercy seat is. And, and God's presence among them, typified by that ark. Now David is way off in the wilderness. But though he's far in the wilderness, he knows God, God will hear his prayer upon the ark. I'm reminded of what we talked about, I think it was last week, Philippians 4. Five through six, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. God is never so far away that he cannot hear our prayers. And so from the wilderness, David knows his prayer is reaching God on his holy hill. Selah. So we come to the third part of the psalm, the triumph. That's where it said, I laid me down and slept. I awakened for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves 
round about against me. Just, just think of the great strength David had. He had rested. He had prayed. He had rested. And he awakes with the confidence and strength that he had lacked that night before. And he's ready to take them all knowing the Lord will be with him. Proverbs 3, 24 through 26. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, neither of the destruction of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. A lot of times in the evenings, especially if you had trouble sleeping at night, problems can look so huge. It's time to go to God in prayer. And amaze yourself when you awake in the morning and see how those big problems have just shrunk right down to, to something you can handle now with God's help. And in the triumph, David says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. When I read language like that, I think about David as that shepherd. You remember how David, when he went to confront Goliath as the shepherd, and Saul said, David, you can't go against this giant. He's just a shepherd boy. You can't go against this giant. And he told them the story about when he was out keeping the sheep, and there was a lion that came, and another time a bear came, and he delivered them. I can just see David hitting those beasts in their mouth and breaking their jaw and breaking their teeth and delivering his lambs from that flock. 1 Samuel 7, 34 through 37. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And as those experiences David had had of his deliverance gave him strength to face Goliath, David's probably remembering now other times when God has delivered him and he'll deliver him from this conspiracy led by his son up against him. So he says the word Selah at the end of the psalm. Well now the music comes to a close. In the silence I want you to think about what we just studied. I don't I would not classify the third psalm as a messianic psalm. It's not written to be a prophecy of Christ. and It's not quoted in the New Testament as such, like the second psalm is several times. But still, once you've read the New Testament, there's so many things in the Old Testament that remind you of Jesus. I want you to think about how Jesus had to bear that trial. He went to God in prayer in Gethsemane. He slept the sleep of death in the tomb. He arose triumphant over his foes. And so I think of Christ overcoming this. And we have the promise of Christ that we can overcome our trials. Trials are part of our life and trials can even be good for us spiritually. And so we can take this psalm and learn how to go to God in prayer and see how those in the past gained strength for their trials, gained strength for our trials. And we are promised that if we'll put our trust in the Lord, we will have a spiritual triumph over every trial even over death itself, for death is swallowed up in victory. David says, salvation belongeth to the Lord, and thy blessing upon thy people. Well, we want to be the people of God, don't we? 
When I read how David could face his trials in times of prayer and gain strength, that makes me, that makes me want to do the same. I've got that same avenue toward God. I tell you, it makes me want to be a Christian. So I can be one of the one of those that are counted among the people of God and have that blessing for myself. Well, now the Psalms are full of good things like this, and we'll be going through them once a month on the first Sunday of the month to study them and learn from them. But doesn't that make you want to be a Christian? So you can have that avenue of prayer as you face the trials of your life. If you want to do it, then we invite you to come forward to be baptized into Christ and let all those spiritual blessings be yours as we stand and sing this song.